allow me to introduce myself. I am Ray Joestar of the Joestar family. This is the story of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. Ah yes, JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Part 2, Battle Tendency, also known as the best part of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. To my knowledge, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the highly anticipated second installment of Ouija Talk's JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. You see, I told you it would be out eventually. If you're new to the channel or just missed it the first time around, I made a video talking about the first arc of JoJo's, Phantom Blood, one year ago today. If you haven't watched that, I recommend doing so before continuing this video. Link will be in the top of the description. Fun fact, this was originally planned to be a weekly series as opposed to an annual one, but since I like fucking with my audience so much, I think that this is way more enjoyable. But hey, who knows, maybe by the time this series is finished, I'll have part 5 to talk about. But I think we all know that's probably not going to be the case. Part 1 of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure undeniably left a whole lot to be desired. The characters never got a chance to be fully fleshed out, the pacing was grinding at times, the ending itself was a ridiculous plot hole, we'll get to that, and overall it sticks out like a sore thumb when compared to the other seven parts of this series. That said, I still fucking love it. When it came time for Araki to make a new story in the world he had created, what he did was simple yet scarcely implemented by other writers. He recognized the flaws that Part 1 had, and then, get this, made sure those flaws weren't in Part 2. Hmm, you know, the protagonist seems to be a bit too lawful good, making his character arc feel kind of static. Let me go ahead and change that. The supporting characters were good, but I think I can expand upon the classic archetypes I've already written to create a much more dynamic and interesting cast that plays a much bigger role in the story as a whole. I should do that. The stakes didn't really feel all that high, considering the events of every fight were so painfully predictable. Let's up the danger by just a tad. Seems pretty obvious that one would be able to grow in the art of storytelling with experience, but if that really were the case, then why do so few people actually do it? Don't get me wrong, I'm in no way saying that Araki, while very good at what he does, is perfect. Far, far from it, as a matter of fact. Trust me, just wait for Ouija Talk Part 3, where we'll be going a lot more in depth about how sometimes when Araki takes one step forward, he also takes a hundred steps back. However, this is definitely not the case for Part 2 in the slightest. Battle tendency is, in my opinion, gripping in a way that Phantom Blood simply isn't. On a fundamental level, I would go as far as to say that it is an objectively better crafted story in almost every conventional way. Now, before we go any further and really get into it, I first have to address this. Allow me to predict the future and tell you exactly what you're going to comment down below. Sugin yo mai wa manga o yomu anata wa bakara yo toyu. And to that I say nah. So then, now that that's out of the way, it's time to get into the meat and potatoes of this thing. It is time for I, Ouija, to finally talk about JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Part 2, Battle Tendency. We open up on New York, 1938, where we see a couple of crooked cops harassing and beating a young black man in a dark back alley. There are a myriad of jokes I could make here, but I'd rather not have the Wall Street Journal bust down my door and rip off all my fingernails. A big, hunky Englishman sees this and decides to help the kid out. His name is Smokey Brown, by the way. Punching the shit out of one of the cops and then using some good old hominin breathing to launch a Coca-Cola cap at the other one's finger, shattering it into a million pieces, which is bad fucking ass. Gee, what an out-of-the-box unique way of using Haman. I wonder if this brash, quick-witted fighting style correlates to the character's personality. That'd be some awfully good characterization, if I do say so myself. We learn that this Englishman is none other than Jonathan's grandson, Joseph Joestar, who grew up without a mother or father and has been raised by both Arena and Speedwagon. Speaking of Speedwagon, he's now become a multi-millionaire oil tycoon and the founder of the Speedwagon Foundation, whose primary objective outside of advancing things like technology, archaeology, and medicine is to get to the bottom of the secrets behind the stone mask, making sure its evil powers never again surface. 
Not too long after Joseph and Smokey's meeting, Speedwagon's archaeology team finds a mysterious tomb with a whole bunch of stone masks inside, as well as what appears to be a man trapped inside of an ominous stone pillar. Speedwagon hits up Straitzo, one of the Haman warriors that helped defeat Dio almost 50 years ago, to investigate the tomb with him. He agrees to come along, but then in a dramatic twist of fate, denounces his humanity, just as Dio did, slaps on a stone mask, just as Dio did, and proceeds to kill everyone but Speedwagon just as Dio did. I hope you're seeing the parallels here. Basically, for all intents and purposes, this guy is the new Dio. Streitzo later heads out to find and kill Joseph, thus ridding the world of the pesky Joestar bloodline. But Joseph's like, nah, fuck that noise, you ain't shit. Bang, 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 bang. Boom! Easy! Problem solved! World saved in just one episode. The end. If only things were that simple. Nazi spies have caught wind of Speedwagon's archaeological find and move him, the pillar, and the stone masks to a Mexican black site under the command of Major Rudolf von Stromheim. The Nazis believe that the man trapped inside the pillar is some sort of superhuman they can turn into a weapon, and despite Speedwagon's insistence on them not fucking with the thing, they fuck with it pretty hard by brutally massacring a bunch of Mexican citizens and proceeding to pour their blood directly onto the pillar. As you could probably guess, this was not a very good idea. Stromheim sends a basic bitch vampire who's about as strong as Dio into the containment zone to test Santana's, oh, that's what he's called, by the way, power. Just when it looks like Santana is getting his ass kicked, he grabs the vampire by the head and consumes him by literally shoving the vampire into his skin. This is a monster we have never seen before. Where vampires hunt humans, these things hunt vampires. Naturally, he escapes his containment area and kills everyone in the lab except Speedwagon, Strom, and Joseph, who originally only snuck in here to save Speedwagon, but is now presented with a much more pressing matter. This is where we really get to see Joseph's personality, and subsequently his fighting style, shine. Not to say that his fights with the cops or Straitso didn't already give us a good idea of who he is as a character, but this fight manages to take it two steps further. Instead of simply punching his enemies with fistfuls of Haman as his grandfather would, Joseph takes a much different approach to combat, one that involves wit, sleight of hand, and a whole lot of trolling as opposed to simple brute force. With Joseph managing to outsmart Santana and Stromheim heroically sacrificing his life by throwing himself on a grenade, they're able to get the Pillar Man outside into direct sunlight, turning him back to stone once again. And with that threat being taken care of and Speedwagon being rescued, Joseph can rest easy knowing that the world is saved. Again, if only things were that simple. The Nazis have discovered yet another stone pillar, this one being in Rome and housing not one, but three mysterious stone hunks inside. Obviously, this pillar cannot be allowed to fall into Nazi hands, so Speedwagon and Joseph head off to Italy to save the day. Once there, Speedwagon introduces Joseph to a man who will be accompanying them on their mission, none other than Baron Zappelli's grandson, Caesar Zappelli. Just like his grandfather, Caesar is a very talented Haman warrior, but unlike his grandfather, he absolutely despises the Joestar bloodline. He believes that his grandfather only died because Jonathan got in his way. The two have a bit of a fight. Caesar shows off his signature move, which involves blowing bubbles. Trust me, it's way cooler than it sounds. And then they come to a draw and are like, yeah, fuck this. We kind of got bigger fish to fry. Under the cover of night, the group sets out on their mission. A Joestar, a Zapelli, and a Speedwagon are once again on off to protect the world from fearsome supernatural foes. Oh, and also some rando named Mark is with them who is supposedly Caesar's good friend, I guess? Spoilers, we don't really get to know much about Mark, so just act like he isn't here. The party makes it to where the Pillarmen should be, but instead walk in on a bunch of dead Nazis and three extremely menacing hunks who are definitely no longer trapped in stone. Meet Cars, ACDC, and Wamu. Note the order in which I said their names. Cars is the leader and the strongest, ACDC is Cars' lifelong friend and the second strongest, and Wamu was adopted by the two of them as a baby and is the third strongest. Cars and Wamu also adopted Santana as well, but there is a massive margin in strength when comparing him to the three, making him the fourth strongest. 
Why these three were trapped in Italy while Santana was trapped in South America, the world may never know. We're immediately given a taste of their power when Wamu, to emphasize by far the weakest of the three, accidentally lightly bumps into Mark and half of his body is completely dematerialized. Dio ain't got shit on these dudes. Joseph and Caesar try their best to stop them from leaving the tomb, but they're simply outclassed and promptly get their shit pushed in by Wamu, with Joseph taking the majority of the damage. Just as Wamu is about to deliver a killing blow, Joseph does what he does best in situations like this, bait the fuck out of the opponent. Through taunting and jeering, Joseph tells Wamu that if he lets him go, he'll become strong enough to defeat him within one month and then they can have a proper battle. Wamu, being the proud warrior type, agrees to this proposition, allowing him 33 days to train before their next meeting. However, there's a catch. To ensure that Joseph won't simply run away, Wamu no clips a wedding ring of death around Joseph's heart. This ring will dissolve in 33 days, releasing a virulent poison, and any attempts to remove it will make it dissolve immediately. The only way to avoid the poison is to get the antidote which is in Wamu's lip ring, so there's no running away forever. To make matters even worse, ACDC sees this as a fun little game and decides that he too will put a wedding ring in death inside of Joseph, this time around his windpipe. The antidote for this poison is only in ACDC's nose ring, so instead of having to kill one demigod in the next 33 days, Joseph now has to kill two. Meanwhile, Cars is like, you guys are fucking idiots, come on, we've got shit to do. Up, up, and away! Well, fuck. The timer is now ticking. Joseph and Caesar must become stronger Haman warriors if they want to stand a chance against the Pillarmen, and that means they'll need training from a true master. The two go to Venice, the home of Caesar's longtime Haman coach, Lisa Lisa, who will give them the training they need to help them in their mission. During their stay, they're taken care of by Susie Q, Lisa Lisa's assistant, and also one of the most important characters in the series, so do not forget about her. By the way, over the course of their training montage, Joseph constantly talks about how hot Lisa Lisa is and how much he wants to fuck her, even going as far as to peep on her while she's taking a bath. Just something to keep in mind. Nah! While Joseph and Caesar are off grinding on Lisa Lisa's training island, we see that the Pillar Men are hard at work trying to locate the Red Stone of Aja. Red stones refract light billions of times, making it strong and pure. With that power, cars can make a stronger version of the stone mask that will transform them into the final perfect steps in evolution. Only one red stone in existence has that much juice, though. A large, flawless gem, which just so happens to be in the possession of Lisa Lisa. When the Pillar Men learn this, all three of them attack the island together, use their overwhelming force to kill everyone, take the gem, and take over the world. Oh wait, hold on a second, no, that would make way too much sense. They actually just send ACDC in alone, who ends up getting his ass kicked by Joseph. Their entire existence revolves around getting this stone, but they only send one of them after it. I, I, I don't know, don't think about it too hard. Anyway, after a very entertaining fight, ACDC turns into a blood clot, takes control of Suzy Q's body, and FedExes the Redstone of Aja off to Switzerland where Cars and Wamu are. Joseph kills ACDC for real, drinks the antidote so there's one less poisonous ring of death inside of him, then rushes off to retrieve the red stone with the rest of the gang. As they're driving to hunt down the stone, the whole Nazi invasion of Europe thing is still going on, and the crew gets themselves detained at a roadblock. Turns out the one who ordered their detainment was Stromheim, the guy at the Mexican black site. How is he still alive? Because German science is the best in the world, that's how. He's even got new super cool robot parts, which would be great for, oh, I don't know, fighting against cars in an ambush? Oh, what a surprise! Again, why cars and Wamu are not both going after the stone together, I don't really know. But to sum up an entire episode in six words, Cars does not get the stone. Now the group comes to a bit of an impasse on what they should do next. They discover that the Pillarmen's base of operations is in an old abandoned hotel just a few miles away from their staying, so they could either wait or attack. 
I really love how the show flips the script here. Joseph, who we know to be brash and impulsive, thinks that the best move is to wait for the Pillar Men to come to them, as marching straight into their base would surely result in death. Caesar, who we know to be the calm, collected voice of reason, lets his emotions take over and decides that the best course of action would be to charge straight in and get a surprise attack on them. This really shows just how much these two opposites have rubbed off on each other and how it's affected their personalities. That's some good writing right there. Despite the group siding with Joseph's plan to sit back and wait, Caesar runs off to the mansion anyway, all lone wolf style, and... Well... Let's just say that Joseph did indeed have the superior plan. With his dying breath, Caesar manages to create a bubble infused with the last bits of his Haman, his bandana, and the antidote for Wamu's poisonous ring. Wamu could have very easily walked up and popped this bubble and taken his stuff back, but out of respect for Caesar's strength and courageousness as a fellow warrior, he let it float away. Joseph and Lisa Lisa walk inside just moments before Caesar's death, and again, Joseph did indeed have the superior plan. Kars and Wamu, instead of immediately ripping the two to shreds the moment they walked into the hotel, decide to hold a Roman gladiatorial chariot death match with the Red Stone of Aja going to the winning party. I, I can't really say that's what I would do if I were in Kars' shoes. I'd much rather just kill them and take the Red Stone and become God, but... Okay, sure. To sum up two of the show's most entertaining episodes in just three words, Joseph beats Wamu. Cars honors their agreement, giving Lisa Lisa the red stone, but she's all like, well, fucking, obviously we can't just let you walk away from this, my dude. I'm gonna have to kill you. Oh shit, there's a reason why this guy's in charge! With Lisa Lisa dying and Joseph surrounded by vampires, things are looking bleak, but like a ray of hope in the night, the Nazis charge forward to save the day, just like in real life. Speedwagon, Stromheim, and even Smokey Brown for some odd reason, I don't know why, show up with UV lamps, easily melting through the vampire horde. With the tide turning, Joseph gets the upper hand on Cars, hits him with some good old Haman overdrive, and watches as he falls onto a bed of spikes down below. Stromheim takes aim with his super duper sun shooter, ready to deal the final blow and put an end to all of this. But then, oh shit, he took the redstone and put it into a mask! Oh fuck! Now I'm gonna give you a fair warning, viewers. If you don't think the show about magical sun karate and vampires was weird already, stress Wrap yourselves in, because things are about to get pants on head retarded. Cars evolves into supercars, the pinnacle of evolution, able to manipulate and create life itself. For example, turning his hand into a vampire squirrel that tears through the entire Nazi army. This is the ideal male body. You may not like it, but this is what peak performance looks like. With such an insanely powerful, virtually immortal villain who's immune to both Haman and the Sun, you may be wondering how the hell is our hero gonna take this guy down? I'm convinced that Araki didn't have the answer to that question, so he popped a bunch of pills, put pen to paper, and gave us the following sequence of events. Joseph books it the fuck out of there, stating he has no idea what he's going to do, and proceeds to leap off the side of a cliff to hijack a Nazi float plane. When shooting cars doesn't work, Joseph decides to ram him with the front of his plane and fly directly into the heart of a volcano. Right before cars manages to escape, Stromheim, who was somehow on the outside of the plane the whole time, who knew, uses his rocket punch to hold cars in place as they go down. Joseph and Stromheim manage to jump off the plane with no parachute at the very last second and survive the fall onto the extremely sharp volcanic edge. But oh no, the fight's not over yet. Cars turns into a crab, because as we all know, crabs can resist molten lava, and then drills his way out of the volcano, cutting Joseph's hand off in the process. Joseph then uses the red stone of Aja, which he picked up somehow, to make the volcano erupt somehow. Cars and Joseph are launched into the sky on top of a boulder. When Cars tries to fly out of the way, Joseph's amputated arm just so happens to shoot up and choke Cars out. Because of this distraction, a bunch of smaller rocks hit Cars, sending him even higher up. The two go so high that Cars reaches escape velocity, while Joseph is all good because he's super glued to this boulder and didn't get hit by a bunch of pebbles. Cars freezes in the infinite depths of space, never to return to Earth again, while Joseph falls back down to Earth 
from orbit, crashing into the middle of the ocean, and, of course, surviving all of this with no real major permanent damage. Just go ahead and slap a robot hand on yourself, and bada boom, you're good as new. Remember Susie Q? I told you she'd be important. She spends two weeks nursing Joseph back to health in Venice, also they get married, then they fly back to New York where Joseph's like, haha friends, I'm actually not dead, and then they all live happily ever after. The end. Oh, and also Lisa Lisa's Joseph's mom. Joseph wants to fuck his mom, that's canon! So there you have it. That is JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Part 2, Battle Tendency. And it certainly took a whole hell of a lot longer to fully explain than Part 1. For good reason, though. A lot more interesting shit happened, which is why it's so much better. Where Part 1 has a giant, boring wall smack dab in the middle of it, Part 2 is a straight, action-packed shot of constant story progression that makes it difficult to put down. The characters are so much more interesting, the antagonists are so much more threatening, and most importantly, the story as a whole is so much more unpredictable. The gap in strength between Jonathan and Dio existed, yes, but they were about evenly matched when you boil things down. The Pillarmen, on the other hand, completely and utterly dwarf the strength of Joseph, or Caesar, or anyone else for that matter. You need more than just brute force to kill them. You also need wit and unpredictability, a fighting style which perfectly reflects Joseph's character. If he had took Jonathan's approach of fighting, i.e. just hitting things really hard and fast with Haman, he wouldn't have stood a chance. Instead, Araki kept every fight interesting on the sole principle of just how overpowered and dangerous the Pillarmen really are. You need to think outside of the box to defeat them, so Joseph outwits and trolls his opponents to death by concocting up these various schemes to get the upper hand, which is infinitely more fun to watch. You want the viewer to be as engaged as possible. You want them to think, well shit, this is bad, how's he gonna get out of this one? I guess I gotta keep watching to find out, because that right there is the mark of an entertaining story. The other aspects of this show, simply on a technical level, are also top-notch. David Productions once again poured their heart and soul into making the best animated adaptation this could be, and it definitely shows. Even watching this show for the first time with zero knowledge of the manga, you can clearly tell there are a lot of one-to-one -one shots they pull from. It feels and looks like a moving comic, and I absolutely love that style. You all know from the first video that I am a sucker for good color schemes. Well, I'm happy to say that they've kept up the tradition of putting off-the-wall colors during certain moments, especially the fights, and they look fantastic. Music-wise, it's a really weird mix of synthesized orchestral music, sometimes breaking out into straight-up dubstep. It's really inconsistent, yet very fitting at the same time, and it matches the overall feel of the show perfectly. Speaking of music, let's talk about the references. Some of you more perceptive folk out there have probably picked up on the fact that almost every single character in this show is named after an 80s music reference. For example, Wamu, ACDC, and Cars are named after the band's Wham, ACDC, and The Cars. The reason Araki did this, and even continues to do it to this very day, is simply because he's a big fan of Western music. It doesn't really impact the story at all, but I think it's really charming and endearing, and allows us to learn more about what the writer himself enjoys and takes inspiration from. To me, it's really cool that we get to have that kind of a window. It's amazing to see Araki turn the weaknesses of Part 1 into the strengths of Part 2, something we'll see him do yet again with Part 4 compared to Part 3. Battle Tendency is the perfect example of why I love the writing of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. It's constantly putting itself out there and trying new things. Sure, some of these things work a lot better than others, but Araki learns from his mistakes, and chances are whatever he got wrong, he'll eventually fix. This story was written over 30 years ago, but it still manages to feel fresh and innovative even by today's standards. If you're at this point in the video and you still haven't watched Battle Tendency, what is wrong with you? Go check it out ASAP. I promise you won't regret it. Hope the year-long wait was worth it, kids. And if it wasn't, I apologize. There's always next year, right? And believe you me, I'm gonna have a whole lot to say next year. But for now, though, I guess you could say that this series is to be continued.